Surah Al-Hajj, we will begin from ayah number 30. ذَلِكَ that, meaning whatever has been mentioned so far, is how it is. Meaning the commands, the injunctions related to hajj, have been made clear over here. Now the word ذَلِكَ, remember when it comes at the beginning of an ayah, it is for the purpose of separating two sentences. Like for example, when you're writing, when you have completed a statement and you want to transition to a new statement, then you need some words over there. So for instance, you say things like, however, right? Or moreover, correct? So similarly, ذلك, that. Meaning that is that. And now, وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ حُرُمَاتِ اللَّهِ And whoever does ta'zim of the hurumat of Allah, فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ then it is better for him. In the previous verses, we learned about the various rituals of hajj. For example, tawaf, likewise the stay at mina. Similarly, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much during the days of hajj. right? And then coming out of the state of ihram also. ثُمَّ الْيَقْضُ تَفَثَهُمْ وَالْيُوفُ نُذُورَهُمْ And then also the ritual of sacrifice. So all of these rituals are mentioned. But then Allah says that whoever does ta'zim of the hurumat of Allah. What is ta'zim? Your azim from ta'zim, ayn zamim, azamah. Azamah is greatness and ta'zim is to hold something in great respect. Meaning to show respect to something, to venerate, to exalt, to think great of something. So whoever treats with respect, whoever thinks great of the hurumat of Allah, what are the hurumat of Allah? Hurumat is a plural of hurma. And what is hurma? Hurma, what comes to your mind when you hear the word hurma? What word comes to your mind? Haram. Right? What is haram? That which is forbidden. You're not allowed to do it. Right? This is one word that we learned so early on. Right? This is haram, this is haram, this is haram. So anyway, hurma is that object or that place that must be respected. Meaning disrespecting it, violating its sanctity is something haram. Like for example, we learned about the haram. The Kaaba, the area around the Kaaba, Masjid al-Haram. What is that? It is of the hurumat of Allah. Why? Because its sanctity is necessary. A person is not allowed to violate its sanctity. And how is its sanctity violated? When a person would cause bloodshed over there, right? Or he would commit sin over there. This is all part of violating the sanctity of a hurma, right? Of a sacred place. Another example of this could be, like for example, Shahrul Haram, a sacred month, right? In a sacred month, for instance, the month of Dhul Hijjah, it's the month of Hajj, it's a sacred month, certain things are not allowed. Muharram, it's a sacred month, certain things are not allowed. Fighting is not permissible. And if a person goes on fighting, what is he doing? violating the sanctity of the sacred month. Similarly, if a person is in the state of ihram, you understand? If a person is in the state of ihram, can you fight with him? Can you argue with him? No. لا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. Right? Likewise, an, a sacrificial animal, we learned about this earlier, قلائد. Remember that the Arabs, when they would take their sacrificial animals at hajj to Makkah for sacrifice, they would mark those animals in order to separate them from the rest. So for instance, a sacrificial animal, there would be a garland around its neck. So that from far people would know, these are hujjaj and these animals are for sacrifice. What does that mean? That you don't mess with these people. Even if you want to attack them and confiscate their belongings, you don't do that. Why? Because they are sacred. They are the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you understand the concept of hurumat? an object, a place, a person, something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us that it is sacred. Its respect is necessary. It could be a time, it could be a day, it could be an action, it could be a place. Alright? Now the word hurumat also applies to the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Why? Because opposing them is haram. You understand? So for example, a person goes for hajj. What are of the hurumat of Allah during hajj? The various commands, right? The various rituals that have to be performed. The word hurumat also applies to the prohibitions. Things that are not allowed. 
Why? Because doing them would be violating Allah's law. Right? Going against it, contradicting it. So whoever does ta'zeem of the hurumat of Allah, whether it's the times or the places that Allah has deemed sacred, or it is an action that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded, or it is something that Allah has prohibited. In other words, whoever abides by the laws that Allah has given, he observes them with respect, with the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ Then it is better for him. عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ Near his Lord. You see, many times it happens that we are doing something that is part of the deen. And we're doing it right. Why? Because that's how it's supposed to be done. And sometimes we'll do it right. Why? Because people are watching. Out of the fear of people. But what do we learn here? Don't do this just out of fear of people. Do it out of whose respect? Respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So check your intention. And sometimes we are performing our rituals, but without any spirit. We are performing our salah, but without any love, without any fear. You know, people are going for hajj, they're going for umrah, but they don't know what they're doing, why they're doing it. They're just following the crowd, complaining, whining constantly, upset about why things are not going perfectly. There's no ta'zeem over there. There's no respect over there. The heart is not involved over there. So the person who performs these rituals with the right state of heart, with respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is better for him in the Rabbi near his Lord. Because remember that the ritual, it is very important. It is very important. But at the same time, what's the state of the heart? That also determines the outcome of that ritual, the reward for that ritual. You know, like we learned yesterday, that sometimes we are more concerned about the lack of resources, whereas we should be more concerned about the lack of ikhlas, the lack of sincerity. وَأُحِلَّتْ لَكُمْ And it is made permissible to you. الْأَنْعَامْ The grazing livestock. Meaning, you're allowed to eat these animals. إِلَّا except مَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ That which has been recited to you. Meaning, it's not that all grazing livestock are, are halal. There are some exceptions. What are those exceptions? You've already been informed about them. Like for example, in the Qur'an we have learned that the mayta, dead animal, for example, a dead cow, can you eat it? No, you can't eat it. Likewise, if it has not been slaughtered properly, can you eat it? No, you cannot eat it. Some people might consider that of the livestock are, for instance, pigs. But are they considered halal? No, they're not. So, إِلَّا مَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ The exceptions are already informed to you. Why is this being mentioned over here? That what Allah has made lawful, consider that to be lawful. What Allah has made halal, you should consider that to be halal. Because in hajj there is also ritual sacrifice, right? That should be of which animal? An animal that you wish? No, an animal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed. فَجْتَنِبُوا So avoid, meaning during hajj, avoid الرِّجْسَ The filth. Which filth? مِنَ الْأَوْثَان Of the idols. أَوْثَان is a plural of وَثَن And we have read different words for idols. وَثَن in particular is used for an idol that is made of something like wood. All right? Or for instance, the mushrikun, what they would do is, you know, for instance, a tree would be considered sacred. All right? And what would people do? They would go and, you know, make their promises or their pledges, seeking help from an idol, and they would tie a thread or something like that to that tree. All right? Or a particular place would be considered sacred. So a flag would be put over there. All right? A landmark would be put over there. And such sites were all around Makkah, in Makkah and also around Makkah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاجْتَنِبُوا Avoid a rijsa min al-awsan Keep away from idolatry. Because you see right now, when the surah was revealed, the Muslims were in Medina, but Makkah had not been conquered yet. So there was still idolatry in Makkah. But many Muslims were able to go for hajj or for umrah. Alright? Not everybody, but some of them were able to go. So these guidelines are given that when you go for hajj, keep away from any form of idolatry. Avoid it. Why? Because it is something filthy. It is something dirty. You know like, if you go somewhere, so for instance, if you're going to your home country, let's say you're from India, right, and you're visiting India, what will people tell you? When you go there, make sure you watch what you eat. Right? Don't eat salads from outside. Don't eat dairy. 
right? Don't drink tap water. Be very careful about what you eat. Why? Why? Why do they tell you to be careful about what you eat? Is there any reason? So that you don't get sick. So that you don't get sick. Because if you get sick, then what will happen? You can't enjoy at all. I remember when I visited Pakistan a long time ago, after several years, there is this thing that we eat in Pakistan. It's called Golgappa. All right? It's like a, what is it? It's like a savory treat. Okay? It's very delicious. Anyway, so and the best is that which you find outside on food stalls. All right? That is obviously covered with a million flies. So one of my friends, they said, you know, let's go. I'll take you. I'm like, okay, fine. So I went. And when I sat in the car looking at that cart, you know, where the gold guppas were being sold, my husband goes, I'm not touching that thing with even a 10-foot pole. You know, I'm not going close to it. I'm not even going near it. And I was like, come on, I want it. He's like, no way. Nobody's having this. Because if we have even one, we know what's going to happen. If you get sick, you can't enjoy your time there. Right? Then all the time that you're spending over there, useless. All the money that you've spent, useless. Because you can't have fun. So you have to keep away from certain things in order to enjoy other things. So just like that, shirk is dangerous. It destroys a person's good deeds. Even though it may seem very tempting. You know, just read that. You know, for instance, you have those horoscope or whatever. Right? So just read it. This is fun. But you read it and you don't even realize you believe in it. And your deeds are wasted. Right? If you go to a fortune teller and you ask him and you believe in what he says, what is that? It's shirk. It's ruined everything for you. Even though it was very tempting. But it ruined everything for you. So this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَجْتَنِبُ الرِّجْسَ مِنَ الْأَوْسَانِ It's dirty. It's sickening. Keep away from it. وَجْتَنِبُ And avoid قَوْلَ zur. The words which are azur. What is azur? Falsehood. Untrue. Azur is basically a lie. A false statement. A saying that is deviated from the truth. Which is far from the truth. Zur literally is used for a stone that is left apparent when digging a well. So imagine a person trying to dig a well. Alright? And then there's a huge stone or a rock. And he's not able to break it. He's not able to pull it out. He's not able to get rid of it. So what does he do? He just leaves it there. Alright? And he continues with his digging. Now there's a big bump in the middle. You understand? It's not smooth. It's not a straight hole. There's a huge bump in the middle. So, this is the literal meaning of the word zur. Now from this, zur is used for a lie also. Why? Because it's not true, it's not smooth. It's not correct. It has an error in it. It is far from reality. So keep away from qawl zur What does it mean by this? Meaning when you go for hajj, keep away from saying words which are not true. Words that contain shirk. You know, for instance, the mushrikun, when they would go for hajj, they would say the talbiyah. What is talbiyah? Words of hajj, right? لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ What does it mean? Here I am, O Allah. Here I am at your service. لَبَيْكَ اللَّهُمَّ لَبَيْكَ لَبَيْكَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ لَبَيْكَ لَبَيْكَ Here I am, O Allah. You have no partner. But you know what they would say? They would say, لَا شَرِيكَ لَكَ إِلَّا شَرِيكًا هُوَ لَكَ Except for the partner that you have. You have no partners except for the partners that you have. So this was a false statement. This was a false statement. But people were saying it without even thinking. So the Muslims were told, when you go for Hajj and you hear the whole world saying this slogan, you don't say it because it is false. It is not true. Now, is there a lesson in this for us? What's the lesson? Just because everybody's saying something doesn't mean you have to say it too. Right? And it's amazing. When you go for Hajj, you find people saying the most shocking things, shocking statements, especially in Medina. Right? How people are making dua to the Prophet ﷺ or the words of shirk that are being said so openly, loudly, and the rest of the people are just following along. Because my group leader gave this book to me, I'm going to read everything which is in it. Well, what's the reference? What does the book say? Where did these words come from? 
You know, for instance, you'll get a whole book on the different salawat that you can send to the Prophet wasallam, And they have no basis in the sunnah. No basis. And, okay, even if they have no basis in the sunnah, when you analyze the words, they are full of shirk. You know, sometimes we sing songs, or we sing nasheeds. Alright? And because we heard a statement in the nasheed, we like how it sounds, we say it without even thinking that these are words of shirk. These are words which are not true. These are words which are not appropriate. Now, I'm not going to cite examples over here, but the lesson over here for us is, use your mind. Use your mind. Don't just say something because everybody's saying it. Think about it. What's the evidence? What's the source? Has it come from the Quran? Has it come from the Sunnah? What does it mean? وَاجْتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ zur. Because you see, a little bit of shirk even is enough to destroy a person's good deeds. Isn't it so? Even a little bit of shirk can destroy a person's good deeds. So it's so important that we keep away from shirk. And we have to be conscious about this matter. Because imagine a person spent so much time, so much money going for hajj. And when he goes there, he does things which are incorrect, which are clear shirk. Deeds are wasted. Hajj is not accepted. What was the point? What was the benefit? Nothing. So be careful. وَاجْتَنِبُوا قَوْلَ zur. And even in general, keep away from false statements. Not just during hajj, not just when it comes to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in general also, keep away from false statements. In a hadith we learned the Prophet wasallam said, أَلَا أُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِأَكْبَرِ الْكَبَائِرِ Should I not tell you about the worst of major sins? The worst of major sins. The Sahaba said, yes, Ya Rasulullah wasallam. He said, associating others with Allah. Shirk. And disobeying one's parents. Disobeying one's parents. This is also of the Akbar al-Kaba'ir. The Prophet ﷺ was reclining at this time when he said this. And then he sat up. He sat up and he said, and giving false statements or bearing false witness. Shahadatu zur or qawlu zur. Even this is from the Akbar al-Kaba'ir. False statements, lies. Keep away from them in general and also when it comes to deen. Hunafa alillahi. Hunafa. Inclining to Allah. Meaning only to Allah. Because Hajj is about a journey for whose sake? For the sake of Allah. Responding to whose call? The call of Allah. Right? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Here I am, O Allah. Here I am. Throughout Hajj you say this. Here I am, here I am, Allah, at your service. I'm here to obey you. You called me, I'm here to answer your call. Hunafa alillahi. So when you go for Allah, then do this only for Allah. Keep your intention sincere. Hunafa is the plural of Hanif. Who is Hanif? The one who leaves everything, okay, and he inclines or he focuses on his purpose, just one. So for instance, Hanif is someone who is on his path, and then what happens? Distractions. But he ignores those distractions, and he keeps going on his path. This is Hanif. He avoids the obstacles that come in his way, the distractions that come in his way, and he is focused on his goal. This is Hanif. So Hunafa alillah. Your focus in this journey should be only on who? Allah Azza wa Jal. You're going for His pleasure. You'll be patient for His sake. And it's so important to remember this at Hajj and Umrah. Because when you go on this journey, you will certainly be tested. Has anyone over here been for Hajj or Umrah? How was it, the journey, if you describe it in a few words? It was tiring. Anybody else? There's a lot of different things that you need to adjust to. Right? A lot of sudden changes change of plans, right? And each person is tested in a unique way, right? I remember when one of my friends, she went for Hajj, she said, you know, your sabr tests are unique to you. What you find most difficult, that is how you will be tested. That is what you will be tested with when you're at Hajj. Each person. I remember the last time when I went for Umrah, I was expecting at that time, it was summer, it was a month of Ramadan, and I was obviously scared. And I had a two-year-old with me. And my mother said that, just remember what you're going for. 
if you remember that you're going for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has given you the tawfiq to go to His house and worship Him over there, then you know what? Anything that comes in the way is worth it. Any difficulty, any hardship that comes in the way, it's worth it. Don't worry about it. Ignore it. Let it go. Don't dwell over it. Just be grateful for the very fact that Allah is giving you the opportunity to go there. And alhamdulillah, these words, I kept reminding myself of them. And with the many difficulties of the journey, I survived. Alhamdulillah. It was easy. Alhamdulillah. Why? Because the state of mind. So here we need to accept. Your focus clear in front of you. Hunafa alillah. I'm going for the sake of Allah. So whether it's easy or it's difficult, whether I'm hungry or I'm tired, I'm sleep deprived or stuck in traffic, people don't understand what I'm saying and I'm being treated unfairly. Ignore it. Let it go. You're going for Allah's sake. You get to go to the house of Allah. So what if you have to suffer a little bit in Allah's way? So hunafa alillah. غَيْرَ مُشْرِكِينَ بِهِ غَيْرَ Not مُشْرِكِينَ Associating partners بِهِ with him You're going as a Hanif Do not associate any partners with him Why? Because وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ Whoever associates partners with Allah فَكَأَنَّمَا Then it is as if خَرَّ He has fallen خَرَّ رَ خُرُور To fall down with surah with speed so imagine a person falling down from where? Mina sama, from the sky. Falling down from the sky. Not with a parachute. No, just falling down from the sky. What will happen to him? فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْر So the birds snatch him away. تَخْطَفُ خَطَفَ خَطْفَ إِلَّا مَنْ خَطِفَ الْخَطْفَةَ To snatch something, to grab something quickly. So the birds they snatch at him. They grab him quickly. Because you see many large birds, where do they catch their prey? How? Mid-air. During flight. So, فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ The birds snatch at him, meaning they catch him. And they eat him up. Oh, or, if that doesn't happen, then what will happen? تَهْوِي بِهِ الْرِيحُ الْرِيحُ, the wind, what does it do? تَهْوِي بِهِ It blows him off. Tahwi hawa ya. Hawa. What is hawa? Air. Alright? So tahwi bihi, meaning the wind blows him off. The wind takes him away, carries him off. Where? Fi makanin sahiq. To a makan, to a place that is sahiq. That is remote. That is far off. Sahiq seen haqa. Suhuq. Suhuq is to be distant, to be remote, to be very far away, ba'id. So the one who does shirk, his reality is described over here. And what is that? That it is as if a person has fallen from the sky, and as he is falling, birds snatch at him, meaning they catch him, and they eat him up. Or if that doesn't happen, the wind carries him away, where? To a place that is very far. And when he will fall to the ground, what do you think will happen to him? If a person is falling from the sky, straight to the ground, what is going to happen to him? In other words, what is being stated over here is that the person who does shirk, then there is no doubt about his destruction. About his complete and total loss. There is no doubt about his destruction. He is ruined. And the damage is irreversible. If a person dies doing shirk, it's irreversible. Because any sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive it. If He wants, He'll forgive it. However, when it comes to shirk, Allah will not forgive it. What's the evidence for that? That Allah will not forgive shirk. What's the proof of this? That Allah will not forgive shirk. If a person comes on the day of judgment, having committed serious sins. If Allah wants, Allah can forgive him. But if a person has done shirk, then there is no forgiveness for him on the day of judgment. What's the proof for this? In Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dhalik. Allah does not forgive shirk being done with him.
When partners are associated with him, Allah does not forgive that. This is why if a person believes in Allah's oneness, and that belief is as small as a mustard seed in his heart, meaning he believes in the oneness of Allah, he doesn't associate partners with Allah, and this belief is very, very minimal, but he has this belief, then what will happen? Even if he ends up in hellfire because of his many sins, eventually he will be taken out. Eventually he will be removed from hellfire. But a person who has done shirk, there is no forgiveness for him. And that is what is described over here. Total ruin, total loss. فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرُ أَوْ تَهْوِي بِهِ الرِّيحُ فِي مَكَانٍ سَحِيقٍ This is how dangerous shirk is. It's as if you're falling off a cliff. It's as if you're falling off a building. It's as if you're falling off Burj Khalifa. Imagine. Falling off from that building, from the top of that building, what would remain of you? You know when a person is falling off from a height, they say that person dies even before they hit the ground. They're dead even before they hit the ground. They're finished. And when a person hits the ground, then what happens? The body is just shattered completely. I remember I heard someone describing a scene. They had seen someone fallen off their building and they said that it was just like a pool of blood and in the middle of it, it was you couldn't even tell what it was. If it was a human being, you couldn't tell what the head was, what the arm was, what the hand was, what the leg was, what the back was. Everything was just totally shattered. So vivid description is given over here to make us realize that shirk is a destructive sin. Even a little bit of shirk is enough to ruin a person. All the good deeds that a person has accumulated, shirk is enough to set them on fire. ذَلِكْ That, meaning that is so. وَمَنْ يُعَظِّمْ And whoever does ta'zim, whoever honors شَعَائِرَ Allah, the symbols of Allah, فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Then it is from the piety of the hearts. Notice over here, شَعَائِرَ Allah. Earlier we learned, حُرُمَاتَ of Allah. Here, شَعَائِرْ We have done شَعَائِرْ earlier. شَعَائِرْ is a plural of شَعِيرَة. And what is شَعِيرَة? From شِينَ عَيْنْ رَى شُعُور is to perceive. Right? To get to know. And شَعِيرَة is a signpost. So for example, if you're going somewhere, you're driving on the road, and you see a big signpost that tells you where a particular highway is, then what is that? It's a شَعِيرَة. Right? Because it's telling you about the highway. Right? This is Sha'ira. Now, Sha'ir Allah, what are they? They are places, things, actions, words that symbolize the religion. That remind us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hurumat are what? Sacred places, or prohibitions, or commands. What are Sha'ir? Things, places, objects, even people or actions, words, statements that represent, that symbolize their religion. You know, for everything there are certain symbols. Right? Like for example, certain companies. Macintosh. What's the symbol? An apple. Macintosh is also an apple. Right? So anywhere you see that bitten apple, what does that represent? That particular company. Right? Nike. It has a big check. Check mark. So anywhere you see that check mark, what does that remind you of? Nike. Right? The other day somebody showed me a marker. Alright? And it seemed as though it was a Sharpie marker. But when you looked at it carefully, it didn't say Sharpie on it. It was written in the exact same way, but it was actually with different letters. So anyway, when you see that, it instantly reminds you of that particular brand, company, object. Right? So are there some things that remind us of Islam immediately? What are they? Okay, hijab. The Kaaba, good. What else? The Quran, right? What else? What else symbolizes Islam? Masajid. The crescent, okay. Green color, okay. 
Well, there could be many things that have come up over time that don't necessarily represent the deen, but they have been made to represent religion. So for example, an act of terrorism, instantly it's associated with Islam, but it doesn't represent Islam. Right? Certain groups of people, they're instantly associated with Islam, but it's not necessarily a correct representation of Islam. Right? So remember that Sha'a'ir Allah are those which are rooted in the deen. They actually have some bases. So when it comes to a hijab, yes, in the Quran it's mentioned. We find it in the sunnah. Correct? Salah, the Kaaba, a masjid, the beard of a man. Right? Likewise, fasting, going for hajj, all the rituals of hajj, the recitation of the Quran, the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The prophets, the sahaba. Right? There's so many different things that represent the deen, that remind you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, sha'ir Allah, Allah says, whoever respects them. So whoever respects the Quran, whoever respects the masjid, whoever respects the hijab, whoever takes care of the cleanliness of the masjid, all of this is from what? فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ Then this is from the taqwa of the heart. Meaning, this is an evidence that there is taqwa in the heart of that person. Where is taqwa? ha huna, In the heart. Right? Now, can you see my heart? Even if you cut it open, can you see taqwa over there? No, you can't. You can't see it. Because it doesn't have any tangible form and any tangible appearance in the heart. But taqwa, how is it manifested? Through actions. Right? Now what are some of those actions that prove that yes, this person has fear of Allah? From this ayah, what do we learn? What is that action? What is that action? Respecting the symbols of the deen. Respecting, loving, treating with respect, what? Anything that has to do with the deen. Anything at all. And this means not making fun of it. Right? This means when it is mentioned, a person, you know, he listens with attentiveness or he pays attention at least. It's very interesting. Every time people quote the hadith, taqwa ha huna, it's usually for the justification of not respecting the symbols of Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the same exact thing for respecting the symbols of Allah. So if you say, like, you have to wear hijab or something, no, taqwa is in my heart. But then Allah says, like, in order to show that you have taqwa, you have to respect the symbols of Allah. In um, Sister Yasmin Mujahid's class, she used the example of a, a mother that says, I love my child, but I don't feed them. And then you'll say, well, there's something messed up about your love for that child. Because if you do love them, then you're going to show it. Exactly. And over here, you see the word ta'lim. If you truly respect it, then you will observe it. You will show that respect with your support, with your acceptance, with your submission. So, وَمَن يُعَظِّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ It is from the piety of the hearts.